morning. Good morning, morning everyone. I'm Terry Lopez, Director of Inclusion and Equity at the Writers Guild of America West. Today's monumental discussion has been a long time coming. It began in 2014 when I was first introduced to MPAC's Hollywood Bureau and its director, Sue Obeidy. Now, seven years later, we are here in partnership to present today's discussion with the Guild's newly formed Middle Eastern Writers Committee. As you know, not all Middle Easterners are Muslim, but because of this accomplishment by two of today's speakers, MPAC felt that it was important to elevate the voices of yet another underrepresented community. With that, I would like to thank all of our panelists and most importantly, Sue and MPAC for this incredible opportunity and for their ongoing work in changing the narrative of Islam and Muslims in the entertainment industry. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Terry, and thank you, the Writers Guild of America West, for co-hosting today's panel, Middle Eastern Writers in Entertainment. Hello, everyone. My name is Sue Obeidi, and I am the director of the Muslim Public Affairs Council's Hollywood Bureau, MPAC's Hollywood Bureau for short. On behalf of MPAC's Hollywood Bureau, I would like to thank the staff and volunteers of the Sundance Film Festival for their rising to the occasion and making this year's festival possible. In particular, I'd like to thank Carrie Putnam, Tabitha Jackson, Mary Sadegi, Melinda Garcia, and Casey Hindman for their incredible work and the tenacity they had to put forth to make it to, make it to this weekend. And of course, I'd like to thank the staff and board of MPAC for making everything possible. We're very excited to have this conversation today because last year history was made at the WGA West when screenwriters Paymon Kalia and Cameron Fay were successful in founding the Middle Eastern, the Middle Eastern's right, the Middle Eastern Writers Committee. Our panelists will discuss how they are working to boost the visibility and the employment of Middle Eastern writers in the entertainment industry. To, to, to kick off the conversation, I'm so happy to introduce and turn it over to Lorraine Ali, who is the television critic of the LA Times. Thank you again for joining us and enjoy the conversation. Thank you, Sue, and thank you all for being here. Um, I'm excited to do this panel. Um, it is a long time coming as far as, you know, they said seven years, but I, this is, I feel like my lifetime has led up to this panel of watching the misrepresentation of Muslims, Arabs, people from that region on screen. So I'm really excited that we're doing this. So I wanted to introduce everybody. Um, I'm going to start with Paiman Kalea, whose last name I probably just slaughtered. He is a two-time Emmy-nominated Iranian-American TV comedy writer whose work includes Sunnyside, The Cleveland Show, and Big Hero 6, the series. Welcome. Hello. Next, I would like to introduce Shireen Diabas, an award-winning producer, writer, and director whose work includes Amrika, May in the Summer, Rami, Ozark, Empire, and Quantico. Just a few little shows there, like... <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Shireen. Thank you so much. Next up is Cameron Ali Fay. Uh, he's a WGA award-nominated screenwriter whose work includes Brother Nature and Dance Camp. He's currently working a Western for director Paul Feig, whose name I hope I just said right. You did. Thank you, welcome. Hi. And last but not least is Daria Politan, and she is a creator and executive producer of Devil in Ohio and writer producer with Jack Ryan and Castle Rock. She's also a playwright, author, and founder of The Kilroys. Hello. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. How are we today? Good. Collectively. <laughs> um, okay. So, as a kind of introduction to this panel, um, you know, I was really shocked to find out that uh, Middle Eastern writers make up only 0.3%, 0.3% of the total employment in writers' rooms. Okay, so that's astounding to me because we are on screen so often, right? And often misrepresented. So I wanted to just start by, um, obviously the, the reasons are, somewhat clear of why you, 
Paimon and Cameron wanted to start this committee, but can you talk about what it took to kind of get that off the ground and what the goals are and kind of where we are at this point? Yeah, Paimon, you wanna start? Sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, basically about 10 years ago, I, I originally tried to form the Middle Eastern Writers Committee at the WGA. And um, at that time, there was no way to identify Middle Eastern writers within the guild because there wasn't the infrastructure <clears throat> on the website to identify as Middle Eastern. There wasn't a box basically to check. So it was a very difficult process to actually try to find who in the industry was Middle Eastern, who identified as Middle Eastern. So we had to have a formation meeting and you know, basically I think two people showed up who were there in support and it was great, but they, they turned out to not even be, I think they were just white. Uh, so it was just me. Um, so cut to, you know, 10 years later and, and finally, you know, we, we've gotten the box to check on the website. So when that study that you referenced of the 0.3% uh, that represents, you know, of Middle Eastern writers that are employed in features and TV, uh, we, we saw that study and actually Cameron um, contacted me and asked me, you know, have you seen this study? And that really kickstarted, you know, trying to reform this committee. And since we had that box checked and there were enough people that we saw on the website, we said, maybe we can do this. You want to take it from here, Cameron? Yeah, no, I mean, that was, that was it. It was just, it's just a, a, a matter of, you know, I think Daria, you might've talked about how you've been trying to get that box um, for years. We, I've been trying to get that, well, I've been trying to get that box and, and um, actually another Cameron, another Iranian Cameron came to me and was like, have you seen this study? And he actually, you know, sent it to me first and, and it blew my mind. And he was like, we need to form a committee. And I was like, yeah, I'm gonna get Paymon involved. And then he was like, oh, but I'm too busy, bye. And then so, so then it was just Paymon and I, and, uh, and we just ran with it and we reached out to people like Daria and Shireen and, and actually found out that, you know, there are about, uh, I don't know, at this point, maybe 80 to 100 people that identify as Middle Eastern um, in the WGA. I'm sure there are more that haven't even clicked the box yet. Yeah, and that number was just so, so such a, a hard number. Those are kind of the first time we actually saw a hard number that we could actually say, hey, look, like, we're not just imagining this. This is actually real. Or, you know, we are completely underrepresented. We have proof now. So as far as, you know, advocacy and, and activism, like me and me and Cameron have been going around trying to, you know, educate people about this, uh, the specific study. And so, okay, you've, you founded this and I, I just want to ask you, um, Shireen and Daria, like how, it, we, how, how important was it once you, or, or like how game changing did it seem to you once you kind of realized there could be this group helping us get more nuanced uh, portrayals of Middle Easterners out there? You know, did it feel game changing or did it feel like, okay, this is one more thing that possibly isn't gonna work? It's been a frustrating climb. I mean, for, for me, you know, it was such a massive milestone because, you know, I got my first, I, I got my first job in a writer's room back in 2005 or something. It was, you know, it feels like ages ago now. And um, it was such a, such an incredibly different landscape. Um, and, and just through the years, kind of seeing the difficulties of, of getting, of really getting our, our portrayals right. Like really like, you know, it's so interesting because so many of the jobs that I've, I've either taken or been offered have been like, hey, we wanna tell stories about you and we want you to help us get it right. And um, that became intensely frustrating over time because I, I just finally was like, how about you get me to tell the story? How about you, how about I'm in a position of power to help actually tell the story because you know th there's the experience of like I'm the little you know I'm a producer in the room and there's all these people who are above me who and I'm not able to really affect change so this it just felt like I it started out very lonely you know in the early 2000s when you're you're, you're sort of starting out as like a baby writer and trying to get your own work made and then and then to have this 
you know, to, to have this committee form for me was just a massive milestone of really how far we've come. And the fact that like, there are so many of us, like to me, it was really exciting. I was like, oh my God, there's so many of us now. I mean, there's still so much further to go, but the fact that we're organizing, I mean, you know, I, I just like to say thank you to Cameron and, and Paimon for, for, for doing this um, and for really, for organizing and making it so that we can actually have a voice. I think that's just so important. I agree. I mean, I think there's so much significance to that box, you know, having that box there to check, because I think in the in the bigger picture, you know, when you're filling out government forms or the doctor, they don't, you know, Middle Eastern gets lumped in with Caucasian. And there isn't, so you're not counted, you're not represented, there isn't a space for the voice. So I think, and I, and I, like I told Cameron and Paimon, I was like, email the guild. I'm like, you need the box. You need the Middle Eastern box. I'm Middle Eastern. I need to like, you know, I need, I think it was a few, you know, it was later in my life that I realized that my differences from other people were my strengths. And, you know, I'd spent so much time in my earlier years trying to fit in, trying to be regular, normal American, eat my white bread, you know, and, and ham and cheese and not my smelly, you know, spicy foods like, and, uh, you know, so there, there is just having the visibility, having the place for it, having this type of, you know, panels and, and, and bringing it to um, the, the consciousness and the conversation just completely opens the door and, and is a game changer. And, you know, as a, as a, well, maybe we'll get to it later, but I can talk to, you know, speak to how as a writer, you know, just normalizing, having Middle Eastern characters just as part of the cast, they're not the bad guy. <laughs> they're not the terrorist, you know, that like just a regular person on the team of the people or the friend or the lead, you know, can be Middle Eastern and just committing to that on the page and saying like, you know, let's not assume that this person is pure Caucasian, you know, they can, you know, there's, there's a place for this person to be Middle Eastern and it doesn't have to be about them being Middle Eastern. I, th I think that's how you start you know, bringing the visibility in, but then it, I'm, I'm just as a writer trying to normalize Middle Eastern representation as part of the mix of the whole. Right, when it's not the standout and there doesn't have to be an explanation of why they're there. And it's right. not like the, you know, the wacky shop owner, the crazy cab driver, the terrorist, or, you know, the three roles we've been allotted. Um, there's the fourth of the woman behind the veil. Um, but uh, I just want to say to you out there watching this, there's a Q&A um, option on your screen. There should be if you want to ask questions, which we're going to answer towards the end of this panel. So, um, so I kind of wanted to ask you um, as, well, first off, there's been these great sort of leaps that I can see, right? Rami being one of them. Um, you know, Master of None had some really great stuff about immigrant culture in it. Um, but we also have things like the new Wonder Woman, um, which is the cautionary tale of like, let's not get too cocky about how far we've come. So <laughs> I'm wondering, um, what do you think are some things that have been signs of progression over, let's say the last few years in terms of the representation of you know, Middle Eastern Muslim people from that part of the world. And also, if you could tell me your background as well. Um, I'm just gonna throw this to Shireen and then you guys can jump in. I'm, I'm Palestinian Jordanian American. Um, and I mean, you know, you, you mentioned Rami. I mean, I just think that that was just massive. That show is, um, you know, first of its kind. And I think hopefully opening the doors for others like it. And I feel like for me, it, it kind of marks the, turn, the turning point away from others co-opting our stories to us telling our own stories. And that's really important to me. You know, I think it's incredibly important that we have Middle Eastern, you know, characters that are, you know, just it's not about them being Middle Eastern. They're just like, they're the friend or they're the, the, the partner or they're the whatever, or, you know, the, the husband. And, um, I think that's really incredibly important to kind of, you know, so that we can actually arrive 
um, it, it's almost like we were missing from like the, you know, the cultural landscape, the American cultural landscape for such a long time. And we were just, you know, other people were just sort of here, you know, here's one stereotype after another. We start as thieves and, and harem girls and women and, you know, and then so, slowly evolved into terrorists and, and then evolved into, um, well, you might be innocent, but you still might be a terrorist. And, you know, so there's really been like this crazy evolution from like thieves and Aladdin like, you know, kind of Orientalism to, um, to like the sort of early 2000s of, you know, you're a terrorist, but maybe not to where we are now. Um, and I think that the tide is finally turning towards not only do we want to represent you authentically, we actually want you to tell your story. And that, that to me, like the, the arrival of Rami marked that, that turn. And, and I think we're just at the very beginning of it. I mean, we're still kind of in the tide turning. And that's why I think it's also really significant that this is happening now, that we can all kind of band together and really support each other and push for this type of change. Um, because it's just so important that we're doing it on all levels, on, on the level of like, you know, we, we can be characters in, in these network shows and, and all of these other shows, and then we can also authentically tell our own stories. I remember for the longest time, people really feeling like you can't tell your own story because you're biased. Oh, I mean, yeah. you know that, you know that sense, like, I feel like I, I remember hearing that. I remember getting that, like, no, we need someone opposite. We need someone from a different culture to get an objective perspective or something, you know, and I, and I'm just like, I'm so happy that I feel like we're moving into a time where people are valuing authenticity and, uh, and our community is hopefully, hopefully, you know, at the, at the forefront of like, finally getting to own our narrative. Yeah, the objective perspective is such a good point because I mean, that's even happened to me as a journalist. Well, we need to get somebody like somehow we can't represent ourselves fairly because well, there's questions about your cultures. So somebody else from the outside has to has to check it. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're there. there's that progress. And then at the same time, we're still in that trying to figure it out very like like Sharon was saying the very early stages of it I mean I had a script that was on the blacklist last year and so a lot of people were reading it a lot of people were I was taking a lot of meetings on it and the the lead character is is Iranian and ev not every but m many producers were like but like who do we cast like that's the big question with this how do we we can't cast it it's really like, how do we, who are we going to cast? Who's the name? Who's the person that brings in the money? That's even if you want to broaden outside of Persian, just vaguely, generally Middle Eastern, like the name Mila Kunis kept coming up and I'm like, cool. She's great. She's like, I think maybe Russian. Of the, I don't even know where, like, I mean, and that, that's like, that's where we are right now for me, at least. I don't know for other people, but it's like, it's like, you go a little bit forward, you're, but you're still not in a place where we're able to actually not have the conversation of like, God, who means enough to cast this movie? Uh, like that, that was the hardest thing to hear again and again is like, there's no one that means enough for us to get the financing for this movie. And, and, or you can make the lead white. Like if you make the lead white, the world opens up. That was literally said to me, the world opens up if you make the lead white. So um, I don't know if this movie will ever get made, <laughs> but uh, right now- I sympathize so much with you. I've heard that, all of that so many times. And that's, that almost feels like, um, that's, that's like the next huge hurdle we have to kind of, you know, huge. overcome. And, you know, my worry too, is that like, we have, we have, we have a show in, in, you know, in Rami representing a specific community within the very larger Middle Eastern community. And, you know, we're very, very we're quite varied. And, and diverse even within the, you know, the Middle Eastern category. Uh, my worry is that, you know, that, okay, well, we have one show. My worry is that we're not, you know what I mean? Like we're not, I, I talked to an executive recently who was like talking about how they had this like amazing, amazing narrative American show that they were taking out. And they had like the full package and amazing cast and it was like high concept and they're like, we're gonna sell this. And they went to every network and every network was like, we already have our Native American show. And it's right. just like, okay, so you can only have one other show. You can only have one, you know, Middle Eastern show or one Native American show or one this show. 
but you could have like a million white shows. Can you imagine them saying that? Like, I, we I, already have our white show. So. <laughs> I, I pitched Sorry. a Middle Eastern show and uh, they, they listed the whole pitch and then they're like, yeah, we have a, we have a show about Mexican American immigrants, so we can't do this. <laughs> it's like, sure. oh, I didn't realize we were all in one, <laughs> in one slot. <laughs> like, okay. Wow. We, already have our, we already have our immigrant show. Sorry. <clears throat> yeah. It's. Yeah, I, 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 was, I was gonna say I pitched it. I'm an, I'm an Iranian American Baha'i Muslim. Uh, and I pitched a, a Middle Eastern sitcom a couple years ago. And of course, that was the year that like two Iranians actually stole the shows. <laughs> so they already had their token, you know, Middle Eastern show. So unfortunately that show did not sell, but that is something that Shireen, that is something that, you know, I, I think we are concerned about as a committee is, the, is this Brahmi thing a fluke? You know, is this, yeah. do they have their token show and they're gonna pat themselves on the back and then there's not gonna be any more, um, you know, progress and that's part of our mission, you know, is hopefully, you know, making sure, or at least, help, you know, letting people know that, you know, that that's, this is just the beginning, like everybody's saying, this is, the, this is just the, just imagine we have all these voices in our committee, like, if that's that successful, if Rami is that successful, and that's the perspective we're coming from, is coming from a positive place, like, if, if that is winning awards, and it's, it's doing that well, and people are embracing it, just imagine how many other stories we can tell, you know? Do, do you think that, um, like with that idea, when you look at what's gone on with, you know, black film or um, black leads in TV shows or TV shows that are based, you know, whether you're talking about Insecure, Atlanta, Lovecast Country, whatever it is, um, it's been an amazing like breakthrough, push through. Yes, is there a ton, is there a, a long way to go? Yes. But also with women, particularly on TV, you know, where they're talking about, um, oh my God, there's tons of stuff, Orange is the New Black, whatever it is now, um, or shows led by women, The Crown, whatever it is. Do you think that signals that there, that there is something new happening in a larger sense? In other words, that we can be part of that that you know because it used to be like okay we have our our black show we have our show about women and that is no longer the case right now it's it's and it's pretty huge do you think we're a part of that uh, oh i well i'm uh egyptian american um i think it just they've i think it takes a blitz like i think it just takes like pounding pounding on the doors and 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 you know to, to see more women on screen, to see more black people on screen, to see more Latinx on screen. They, these have been pushing an agent, like it, 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 you, these have been pushing so hard for so long. And I think maybe we're more at the beginning of that um, process, but I, t I think it takes an enormous amount of effort. I think it takes, it might be taking conversations with the, the studios with the networks, with the agencies. Like, I think, I think there's probably work to be done as an industry because I think the industry kind of got behind being more inclusive in those other areas and made space for that. And I, so I think it, we, we may be more on, on the beginning side of those um, conversations and bringing in those allies. And to get those allies, we have to first make a case and be visible and say, hey, here we are. Hey, this is a problem. Hey, look at this data. So I think that's where, to me, it feels like we are in that process and yeah. that room to grow from here. For sure. I totally agree. I think, um, you know, in a way, we're on the margins of the margins. And you know this industry, um, while there have been great strides made in you know making room for like you know for you know black more more sort of diversity, let's say let's say black stories and Latinx and all the things that you say, there's actually still so much work to do on that front too. And um, I feel like you know the the industry needs to really be held accountable 
because the issue is that you know there are moments of like what happened this summer with the the explosion of you know the Black Lives Matter and the civil unrest, and suddenly everyone in the industry is like, oh my God, we've got to do something. We've got to do something. We have to hire more Black people. We have to support Black artists. We have to, and how much of that actually translates into action? How much of that actually happens? Because what I'm looking at is actually not a lot of it happening. I'm looking at a lot of kind of people blowing smoke is what is sort of what I feel just from my own experience and the projects that I'm taking out and the things that I'm working on in the ways in which I'm shocked that people aren't more interested in you know, certain stories. Um, and I, I just think that the industry really needs to be held accountable. And what's really sad to me is it almost feels like they need to be shamed into realizing the unbelievable systemic racism that they have been supporting and that they're continuing to support. But it's, you know, sadly, it's true. It has taken a level of kind of shaming that, that has finally, you know, it's like um, Oscar so white. It's all of these campaigns that have gotten people to go, oh my God, they're right. Like we need to, we need to do something about this. You know, women, you know, me too, public shame. Like, you know, it's, it's really sad that that's what it's taking in our society right now, but it is. I think Shireen, I think we need to recruit you to be uh, <laughs> yeah. a, like a spokesperson for our committee because I mean, Paymon and I talk about this a lot and we've been meeting with various uh, studios, um, talking to various agents and managers to try to, because, you know, that, you know, we hear, we would hear from agents and, and like, oh, you know, you guys don't count as diverse, you don't count. And so we're like, well, where are they getting that from? If you, you, you must be talking to someone at the studio or network level that's telling you that because you would want us to count if it helped us in employment because you get 10% of that. So now we're talking to studios and they're all saying, no, 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 we, we count you guys now. We're going to count you guys now. Now we have to see if that, that happens. So we're taking, we're in the earliest stages of taking the approach of like, let's just have an honest conversation about it and we'll see if you do what you say you're gonna do. And then maybe the next phase, if we don't, uh, if that doesn't work out, is we send Shireen after them and yeah. we shame the laugh. shit out of them. Maybe <laughs> like, um, our but, uh, I'm down, I'm down. I think By the way, I mean, campaign begins. I'm, I feel, <laughs> I feel quite strongly about it, obviously. <laughs> Hey, Mon, do you know how to share our list in the chat, by the way? We have a yeah. list of writers, because someone was asking about where do we find these writers, and we have a list um, that we're compiling of writers, you know, Middle Eastern writers, that um, with all of their credits and information so that hopefully you don't have the excuse anymore as a studio exec, like, well, I don't know where to find the that kind of writer, you know, like, we're, we're spreading that list out wide, and hopefully... Um, when you have when we have the uh, Rami event um, coming up hopefully soon we'll be able to get some press and then share that um, that list in you know in the press too just to get it wider and wider and get get more visibility um, uh, but yeah I'll, the last thing I'll just say and I think I, I didn't say this but Iranian and American but uh <laughs> this is a weird place to put that <laughs> but um uh, you know like it, it, to your initial question you know in the, in the, in the, in the entertainment, if, if you're, I wouldn't have that question if my script was black. I mean, you have a lot of actors and act, you know, male and female. I mean, you have Will Smith and, and Denzel. I mean, Denzel is just one name. Like, you know, who we're talking about. We, we, we now have like two Ramis, basically one in film and one in TV. Yeah. And, 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 and thankfully one won an Oscar and one won a Golden Globe. And so that's amazing. But beyond that, it's a little bit harder. Um, so we're at very early stages, I think, again, is the common theme. And so just something I'll add to what Shereen was saying too is, you know, it's interesting because something that I, I, I think I'm, that concerns me and, and just kind of the idea of like, you know, a movement will happen like Me Too or a movement will happen like, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter thing that, that really, you know, starts, like you're saying, like, like it starts shaming people and the people start like being like, oh my God, we got to do something about this. And I just worry sometimes, you know, like what Cameron was saying, like we don't count. Um, we've been told that by, you know, numerous people, like executives and agents. And I just feel like Middle Easterners get forgotten in the conversation of like underrepresentation, you know? And well, that, I, oh, go ahead, go ahead. 
I agree. And I think it's actually, a, a, there's a, there's a bigger, there's a, there's a beautiful uh, article in the New Yorker uh, by a, a, an Egyptian writer and I, I, I will have to find it. Um, but it's about how uh, we're not counted on the census and we have to check the Caucasian box. And so we're not counted. So there isn't space made for us. And so it, it's actually, it's on like a, a, a huge level. And I remember also, you know, when I was trying to start staffing and I, and I, and I heard like, oh, I'm not, I'm not diverse because I don't fit into uh, Asian American, Native American, African American or Latinx. Those slots, those diversity slots are paid for by a special fund. So they are free to the show. So it's about it's about commerce and it's about the sort of big, like like the buyers. Like maybe we're we're not even notated as a market as a, a share of the market because we're lumped in with Caucasian. So then there isn't the like oh the Middle Eastern buyer. We need to make sure we have shows for the Middle Eastern viewer because we're not even counted. So it's 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 a it's a big it's a big problem um, and. Um, and and <laughs> an up a, a, a David and Goliath, but I'm I mean I'm glad we've I'm glad we started pushing the boulder up the hill, yeah. um, because that's the first that's the first uh, step is drawing attention. I've done a lot of advocacy work for women and non-binary writers in the uh, in the theater industry, and 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 we started just by making noise and being disruptive and like and 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 so I feel like we're at that stage of the process. And, um, and like Shireen said, really holding people accountable and sitting down with people and, and, and like with, with again, the, the sort of the, 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 the studios and the, with the executives, with, with the people who are running the things, you know, um, and making the decisions that filter down to like, oh, you don't count, you know? Um, so, so I'm glad to be on this journey. Uh, but I'm saying it's, it's a, it's a big, it's a, it's a big problem to tackle and at an institutional level. Sorry. Right, Paymon, I think you sent the link to just the panelists and I'm trying to do oh. it and I'm not good at technology. Can you send it to everyone else too? Sorry. Sure. Um, and just my background, I'm Iraqi American. My father's from Baghdad. Um, so uh, I know it's weird that we're randomly throwing these in like, hello, I'm Iraqi American. <laughs> But uh, like this idea that we don't count, right? It, it's, so, it's so ironic to me because we have certainly been represented on screen, misrepresented on screen in myriad ways. And we counted then. We counted as an other at those points. We were used as the other, you know, we, and so, we're seen as that in one way, yet in the writer's room or whatever it is, we're not seen as that. And that, that makes me crazy. <laughs> Just an observation, sorry, okay. Um, <laughs> background wise, I just wanna know, um, and I'm gonna start like uh, going into some of these questions because we have a lot of really good questions, but I just wanna know growing up when you were watching TV, did you ever see anybody that seemed like you, that looked like you, or or in like pop culture? Because I remember looking at Lucy and Ricky, those reruns, and thinking, okay, there's a biracial family, and he kind of looks like my dad. And then I remember being excited because Muhammad Ali was Muslim. That was about it. So I'm just wondering what your experiences were growing up. I mean, I... No, <laughs> I mean, I did not have question. many people that represented me on screen. The people that I grew up, you know, as a child of the 80s and a teenager of the 90s. So I was right in the thick of like, not without my daughter, you know, without came out. <laughs> that was that was amazing for my love life in, in junior high school. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of the other one that was like really, you know, just painted a horrible picture. Um, there's so many. <laughs> yeah. hard, it's hard to pick, really. There's so many. <laughs> I but yeah, the, uh... I mean, like, name any Chuck Norris movie. Um, yeah, I, but I mean, like, I'm trying to think of a positive examples. So, I mean, like, our, our family, you know, we obviously gravitated towards the shows that I think were more diverse at that time, like the Cosby show and um, 
things i'm trying to think at that time there weren't that many it's probably just the cosby show right <laughs> hanging with mr cooper tgi that, that was the show hey that's the show um oh. hang with mr cooper that's a real show um i uh i my mom like and when my grandparents were around they um we watched the the public access iranian <laughs> channel that is the closest thing to on, <laughs> to on screen representation i ever saw i think it was like you know, like those, every, every culture has their public access channel. That they I was watch. excited. I, I was excited. It's funny because like there was a, there was a clip of like, uh, I don't know if you guys remember the movie Clueless, but like they referenced like the Persian mafia in that. And like they cut to a shot of them. They all had like BMWs. And that's another stereotype, by the way, that we never talk about. Like, it's like, oh yeah, there's the terrorist and there's the cabbie, but there's also like the vapid, um, BMW, Harry, cologne wearing um, Middle Easterner. But that was like positive to me at the time. Cause I was like, oh my God, there we are, we're on screen, look. So. And we're not terrorists. <laughs> exactly, I was like, that's a win. <laughs> we're in a comedy. <laughs> oh man, that's so sad. Um, yeah, no, I, I relate in that there was absolutely nothing when I was growing up, there was, um, there was uh, actually just what what we saw in the news you know and I'm Palestinian so uh, that I mean oh, yeah. growing up in a small town in Ohio in the 80s when you said you were Palestinian I mean you never lost friends so fast like it was just suddenly like all the air went out of the room um, and so I, I grew up watching horrific stereotypes and watching you know the news just really I mean skew things in such a way and um and I, and I actually directly felt the result of that type of stereotype and cliche. And um, I mean, it's, it's quite, it's so, it's dangerous. It's so dangerous because as a result of all of that, you know, stuff that was on the television, um, you know, my family was really discriminated against during the first Gulf War, for example. And, and I, I came to conclude that the reason we were so maligned and mistreated was the was the media was the way in which we were portrayed in the media and the fact that there was not a single authentic portrayal of us literally anywhere and that was when i actually started making movies like in just small town in ohio i was like all right i gotta i gotta i want to represent i want to do something i've got to say something um so there yeah there was there was really nothing i mean luckily i grew up my parents had a massive collection of egyptian vhs movies so I grew up watching those and just like really like sort of fell in love with Egyptian cinema of like the 40s, 50s and 60s, which was amazing. You know, it was like our, our um, Hollywood of the Middle East, they called it. But yeah, I um, there was there was nothing. <laughs> Same here. I, I mean, if someone had brown hair, I got excited. <laughs> that, <laughs> I was like the extent of it. I, I, I mean, I remember the movie House of Sand and Fog, I think had some Middle Eastern characters but they like ended up being I, I don't know discriminated against um yeah there, there there really wasn't there really wasn't much it's funny I remember when you're saying House of Sand and Fog I was working at Newsweek and we went to a screening right and it wasn't a great film and there was a bunch of critics in there and I wasn't a film critic um but we all walked out and they're like, what'd you think? And they're all kind of like picking them apart, like the, you know, the movie-esque things about the movie. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, they were Persian. I was like so excited. And everybody was just looking at me like, what is wrong with you? It was really not that bad, but, but you don't understand. It was so even though they were murderous and suicidal, they were there. Yeah. Um, or I remember my dad would be like, Shit is Armenian. <laughs> You know, <laughs> I was like, she's Armenian, share. <laughs> um, Iranians just put an eye at, at the end of any celebrity and just claim them as their. <laughs> Riani, Riani? Is this a, Pretty sure. Iranian. Yeah. It's so <laughs> true. I just. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I wanted to just kind of start dipping into some of the questions because they're they're great questions there's a lot of them um but somebody was asking as people in the entertainment industry how do you deal with the writings of misrepresent misrepresentations of mina characters from your colleagues if your colleagues are writing this how do you deal with that uh, 
I'll, I'll, I, I, I'll, yeah, I'm, go ahead. I'm not... Well, I was just going to say, in the context of like being in a room where like there's st stuff being pitched. Interesting question. <laughs> I mean, I, I, from my experience, I actually was on one of my the first shows I was on was a you know a comedy, and I remember there one of the first episodes being pitched when I was there was a show uh, episode about you know the main character. It was a it was a pretty you know absurd comedy, but it was about a character who like dressed up as a burka and pretended to be a woman. You know, so you get some like you know, information from his wife. I can't really remember what the plot was, but I just remember, you know, just feeling so uncomfortable. And at that time, like, I can't remember if it was Daria or Shireen who was saying, like, when you're a lowly staff writer, I mean, you're just trying to hold on to your job. I mean, like, you have no power in that room. So for me, it, when I've had those experiences, unfortunately, they were when I was very young in my career. So I wasn't able to speak up too much. I was too afraid, you know? Yeah, I, I, I experience. Sorry, Kendra. No, please, please. go ahead. Oh, uh, 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 yeah, please. <laughs> um, I was just gonna say, I also had, I had a pretty intense experience in a writer's room um, where I was sort of hired to be the, the, the keeper or the expert of the, the Middle Eastern sort of characters and storylines, always a little bit uh, of an uncomfortable position to be in. Um, and I, I, I definitely, I, I spoke up quite a bit and, and, and to me, it was just like for that, that for me was the only reason to take the job. And I was luckily in a position where I could speak up because the, the showrunner actually sort of supported me, but he was mostly not in the room. <laughs> and I was in the room with, um, with, you know, some people who really were sort of challenging and, um, were, were pitching things that just were sort of not okay with me. Um, and so it all ended up being okay that, you know, that I did speak up, but, you know, it, it, it definitely, there, it was a scary, there was, it was scary in moments because it was just like, um, yeah, just, just the fear of like really like speaking up and, and speaking your truth. And I mean, I'm so glad that I did, but I'm just saying it didn't come without the consequence of like fear and what's going to happen. But I was also kind of ready to quit. I mean, I was also yeah. sort of like, and you have to just kind of be prepared for that, I think. I mean, hopefully, I sort of feel like things are changing and um, hopefully that type, that type of room or that type of situation won't exist. But I realize as I say that, that that's probably super idealist, idealistic and that, you know, that people will find themselves in, in really uncomfortable situations. And I, I, think, I think you kind of just have to find your allies. Um, and, you know, even in a larger sense, really just sort of find your allies and, um, and, and speak your truth, you know, as, as uncomfortable as it may be, I feel like, and it was super uncomfortable for me, but in the end, interestingly enough, the person that I was often in conflict with in that room ended up respecting me and literally coming into my office at the end of the season and telling me so. Um, which was an interesting kind of, you know, sort of trajectory for that, for that relationship and something that I did not expect when I was in the weeds of like, just not knowing how to handle the situation. I will say just adding, tacking onto that. I mean, the beauty of our committee too, is like, if, you, if people are feeling like it's not an idealistic situation where people can speak up, you know, you, you come to us, come to our committee, you know, and we, we can help, you know, try to you know, express whatever your concerns are, you know. People, people take it a lot more seriously today than, you know, even three, four years ago. I think people are very, as they've seen a lot of horrible yeah. men just get taken down and their career is gone because of things, sometimes even worse, but things they've said or emails they've sent. Um, I think people don't want that to happen. That's not the, necessarily the best reason uh, to, to not say and do horrible things, but I think people are a lot more aware and it's, it's actually a really good time to speak up. I, I remember I was on a, I was in a punch up room for a movie a few years ago, I mean, it was four years ago and, and there was a Chinese character in the movie and there was a Chinese writer as one of the people in the punch up and someone else threw out a joke about like fortune cookie something. I can't remember the joke, but she just went, yeah, no, don't just don't. 
And everyone was like, okay, good. That's like, but one person, I think was one of the, the people running the room was like, all right, let's not try to kill the vibe of the jokes. Let's like, you know, and I'm like, no, she's like, she's saying like, don't go to the fortune cookie joke on this one. Like, so um, I think now people would not say, don't kill the vibe of the joke. People would be like, yeah, no, let's just not go there anymore. So I think it's changing for the better. And sorry, did I just cut you off, Daria? Oh, that's okay. Um, and I also wonder if, and I'm just thinking about this just even in journalism, the fact that I've been in it long enough now and that I am in the room, I think it thwarts those conversations from even happening in the first place. The fact that you are there, you know, um, mm -hmm. yes, before when you were a scrub, when you were just in the door, you kind of had to keep your mouth shut. But the more you've spoken out and the more gravitas you have or the more weight you're pulling in the room, that convert, they're thinking about it before you even sit down with them because you're going to be in that room. And that's how this, that's how this works. You know what I mean? Do you, I, I, I'm mm -hmm. just yeah. thinking about this as we're talking. I think it's leverage and I think it's allyship, you know, like even when I was the staff writer, uh, each, you know, or lower level writer and trying to speak out, it would be about like getting an upper level kind of on my side to amplify, you know, what I was saying and be an ally. And now that I have more say in things, it's amplifying, you know, I have an amplified voice and have more access to amplification and, and um, more, I guess, sway hopefully in bringing on allies. So um, it feels like that's where we can really continue to 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 gain volume is is in bringing more people on board to our cause essentially and um someone's asking in our questions um how do i actually take advantage of the managers and agents who are scouting for diverse talent you know that are middle eastern muslim talent yeah i mean we just sorry go ahead we, 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 I was just going to say probably the same thing you're going to say. I mean, yeah. we just we just did a panel, uh, our committee, it's actually our first event with, you know, specifically Middle Eastern managers and agents. There are some out there that are, you know, but again, like they're at points in their careers probably where I think the message that we got basically was like, it would have to go through a reference or some kind of um, recommendation, right? Is that, is that, basically how they scout talent yeah i mean i think that they like every agent of any background are not really taking unsolicited um material but they're they're actively i mean all of the panelists that we had and and one that couldn't make it we've identified five <laughs> reps so far that are middle east i'm sure there are a few more um but uh they're all, you know, actively looking for not only generally diverse people, but specifically even MENA writers. And um, and I think it's very encouraging because you need those those advocates, those people pushing um, writers that are telling stories that whether they involve, you know, Middle East or not, uh, Middle Eastern characters or not, um, just pushing those writers. And uh, I think it's a good. T I think it's a good time. I, you know, I people ask me all the time, how do I break into this industry as a writer? And I just have no clue today i think it's i think it's very hard um i think tv is more competitive than it's ever been and film the film world has shrunk dramatically um in some ways it's expanded in streaming but in the studio world it's it's really shrunk so um i don't know i just say like uh, contests and hustle I, I don't know i have no clue but um it's it it, it is a good time to to lean into who you are I'm sure as we've all talked about, we tried to minimize, you know, our background as a child growing up, grew up in Virginia. You know, it, it's not like when my, my middle name would pop up on the first day of school, I'd be like, oh, don't say that. Don't say I'm Allie, that's going to be crazy. <laughs> um, uh, so, but now it's like, be, you know, try, be proud of it. And I think um, it'll help you. And it's, it's uh, someone, is it Daria or said it's your strength or is it Shearing one of you guys said it's your strength? Um. There are a lot of people asking, um, is there like in other communities, Latinx communities, Black community, there's, uh, it built almost like these mentor programs to get, you know, 
let me let me back up for a second. So we're talking about the lack of writers in the room, Middle Eastern, um, Muslim. Is it a matter of there aren't enough of us out there? Is it a matter of we're not being led in the room? So in other words, how can we foster more of this talent early on? And are there um, mentorship programs that are starting to build? Are that you know, like where where are we in terms of that? In terms of fostering the talent early on? Well, I I don't think the accountability is. I mean, I don't think just based on our committee. I mean, there are plenty of writers that are wrapped out there, and obviously, based on that study, we're historically underemployed. So it's not that there isn't a talent pool to to you know, hire writers. And by the way, we can write things that are other than, you know, Middle Eastern centric stories, you know? So that, that I don't think is the issue as far as like, yeah, I mean, as far as mentorship and like fostering new talent, I, th I think there are a lot of programs out there the, the diversity programs, especially in TV. I know there, there's a couple of feature programs, every network, every studio has a program like that. And they, what me and Cameron have been doing is going around meeting to make sure that they accept, you know, Middle Easterners and count them as diverse. And most of them, all of them that we know of do. So are now saying they didn't, uh, as, as when Paymon would say, when he went through, which do you want to talk about your diverse, was it Writers on the Verge or? Writers on the Verge. Yeah. I did the NBC Writers on the Verge program. That's how I broke through. So that was, that was like the, my big, you know, way of getting to an agent and a manager and then getting my first staff gig. So I think that's, you know, a great way to get in uh, if, if you're if you're looking to try to, um, especially. But wasn't there something? Wasn't there something when you were actually like going out oh, into oh, the world to get? A, yeah. Yeah, I mean, basically, I was told. Yeah, I was told that at that time, I did not count as a diverse hire because what Daria was saying, a lot of these programs, what they do is they staff people onto shows and they subsidize it. Um, like the network will basically pay for it through a, not through the production budget. So it's basically a free writer in the room. And that creates a lot of problems in itself that I'm sure you, some people can write, uh, have written about, you know, as far as like people getting stuck in that lower level position or getting laid off as soon as that contract is up because they don't want to pay out of their own budget to keep that writer on. So it fosters a lot of bad habits as well. So <laughs> I think maybe if, if I could, I've just staffed a show and so did a lot of reading and uh, of, of material. And I think as a, as a writer trying to break in, if you can make sure to have two killer samples, but maybe one that speaks to your diversity and speaks to being Middle Eastern in case that's being looked for. And then one that's just, whatever's on TV, whatever show you love, you know, whether that's specifically Middle Eastern or not. Um, I think it's good to show that you can do both things. You can be hired, you know, specifically to bring a, a certain POV to a show if they're looking for that. And you can also just, you know, fit into a show about white people, you know, like there's a lot of shows, like we said, there's a lot of shows about white people. There's a lot of jobs. It doesn't matter where you start. You know, you just want to get that first job. You just want to get started. So making sure that you have material that reflects maybe the specific the specificity and the diversity of who you are. And then also just that you can write what's on TV, you know, or you can write, you know, a procedural or or whatever um, it may be. That would be maybe some advice um, for 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 preparing your material to break in. I love it. I guess we need more white representation on TV. I, I just don't, I just don't feel we've had enough. And men, I think there needs to be more men. men. More men, please. Yes. <laughs> um, so one of the questions, and I had talked to you guys about this earlier before we did this chat was, it's so like we're calling this Middle Eastern, right? But we are everything. And so a lot of people are asking in the Q&A right now, how are you defining Middle Eastern? And I, I know this gets all sticky. So can you guys talk to that for a second? Paymon? No. Uh... <laughs> one to you, Paymon. <laughs> uh, 
I mean, that's a, that's a, it's a conversation that Paymon and I have had many, many, many times before build, uh, starting the committee and during, um, we started as defining it as Mina and Minan. Uh, there's so many versions of this and we realized in talking to people in the industry, because this is obviously a WGA specific committee, um, that they don't know what MENA means even. And so we were scared to have the MENA committee and people were like, what is that? And so we wanted to start with a term that people hiring generally white people would understand, which is Middle Eastern. Now, our committee is uh, welcomes everyone. I mean, you know, you could just be a like a dude from Ohio and just white parents and you could come to the committee if you want, if you want to check, like you can do that. We don't turn away anyone, but you might kind of not find it very, uh, like you might not relate to that one, but you, you can come. Um, and, but uh, as we also talk about the, the, the Middle East and MENA and larger, it's a very rich, diverse, sometimes complicated region. And, um, and, and so we started with Middle Eastern. We can always change the name of the committee as we go, as we gain a following, as we gain a presence, as we start to get our foot more in the door in Hollywood, as we start to get more people creating shows like Daria. Um, and, um, but right now we just went with the term that, that everyone knows. Yeah, and part of, you know, that's a really, important thing for us is educating people about you know what what middle eastern is and like how diverse and vast the region is because people i mean we, we tend to get just lumped together and homogenized and i think it's so important to just there's so many rich cultures and traditions and you know beautiful beautiful cultures that that you know we want to represent. So, you know, that's part of like something that we're going to, we're working on right now is we are working on one of those letters, those open letters. And part of that letter will be to, you know, really educate people like about, you know, what Middle Eastern is. If, if Shireen read the, the draft of our letter, she'd be like, this is weak. You need to know what? <laughs> weak sauce. <laughs> Shireen, we it, 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 it was Shireen pass. Yeah, we might need a you know Shireen to come in and send it, send it to me. Send it to <laughs> <laughs> Shireen She's has like tossing it vetting. out. <laughs> Shireen has become the vetting person in this yeah. conversation. I'm, I love it. Somebody somebody recently called me the grandmother of of like Arab American cinema, and I was like, "Do you have any idea how much you just aged me? Like, do you have any idea?" I know I've been around for maybe a little longer than some people, but I was like, what? The I was grandma. both flattered and horrified. Yeah. So but I guess I've been long enough to, I've been around long enough to be radicalized. So yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, you know, we've talked about what some of the struggles have been. Um, if there's like kind of one, high point that you can point to in your career so far where you really feel like it was the moment where wow I never thought I would see this happen like what has it been in the context of being Middle Eastern or yeah yeah the context of what we're talking about and you know either being in the writer's room or or pitching stuff or whatever well, it is or it could be I mean I'll, I'll go I'll go first yeah. I mean, this, the, the forming in this committee for me is just like such a high point in my career as far as, you know, something that I've, I've dreamed of doing and really being, a, you know, a, a building this community, building each other up. It's just, it's just been such a highlight of my life to meet all these people. I wish we weren't in a pandemic, me and, me and Cameron keep on looking forward to those days where we'll actually be in person, where we actually can like, you know, um, Eat food. buy each other's cultures and our yeah. foods and, and, and our listen to our music and, and we're just so excited about that so that to me is it, it, I'll, I'll throw that out there for mine mm, okay I, I mean, think being here right now, I mean, being on a panel at Sundance, that's so cool. <laughs> like, um, and, and I think it, it's, uh, I, I think the digital, uh, forcing us into digital communication with the pandemic actually is a way to be inclusive in, in a neat way. Um, and so I think continuing to use that access and including um, 
diversity of location, diversity of so socioeconomics, diversity of you know thought, you know, and and uh, the 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 virtual world helps us expand that. And I think that we should we should keep what's great about this. Um, moving forward, even when we can be in person and and literally break bread together. Or pita bread. Um, <laughs> or bread, I, think bread. That's a, I think that's a great point. And I'll, I'll just add that, um, that I, I feel so grateful for where we're at at this moment in time in our world in a way, because we uh, can be more honest about these issues. We, we can be more honest than we've ever been. And we can speak openly about things that have been um, really difficult to speak about previously. Things that, you know, before either we felt really alone or we, you know, we didn't, there wasn't a sense of community or um, we felt that we would somehow, you know, that we would hinder our, our career or our abilities to kind of, you know, kind of progress if we were to speak out I feel that, you know, we're at a moment in time now where people, you know, are, are listening mm -hmm. and where we're being encouraged to speak out and we're being encouraged to, to, to actually kind of fight and push. I mean, you know, fight in, a, in, a, in the best possible way, really fight and push for, for change in the industry. Um, that to me is so exciting because I, you know, I feel like from the time of my first feature, Enrica, like, you know, a million years ago, 11 years ago now, I feel like I've been waiting for this in some in some way. So um, so I'm really excited about that. And it's sort of all I feel like culminating right here with all of you. Yeah, I, I think we're we're in a pot we're we're, in a, we're we're there's a positive trend happening for us. And I, I you know I sold a show five years ago that was about my mom coming here from Iran. It was set present day, so it was a character coming here from Iran and meeting a guy at GW University at, in a class that was full of people from different parts of the world, because that's what really happened to my mom and that's how my mom and dad met. And, um, and it didn't go to series, but the, that, the fact that it sold five years ago was really encouraging me. I was terrified to take that show out and be like, yeah, you know, the lead's a Persian woman or, you know, and that, and it, and, but, and the crazy thing is it didn't go forward. I think it was maybe even it may, maybe it wasn't good, but it also was too early um, in some ways. And and now, you know, they still use it as a sample occasionally, my reps. And now there there have been producers saying like, hey, do you want to redevelop that? Like, that's a really good idea. I like that script. We could go out and pitch that now. And I'm like, yeah, no, that would be my dream come true to actually have this show that's about my parents meeting and my mom coming here. Like, that would be, and like the fact that people are reaching out to us saying that is incredible. I'm not like still trying to push this show out. They're coming this way, which is, which is so encouraging, I think. Yeah. yeah. And I was going to say also, you know, like Little America was so good in terms of like immigrant stories and some of, you know, stories from our community. Um, never have I ever, you know, Indian American teen thing, but so good at, and I, those are moments that I never thought I would see on television that like made me weep. Like, I cannot believe that story is being told and beautifully and with humor. Um, okay, I have a question from um, somebody asking, I'm a marketing executive at a streamer. Position, sorry, positioning a show like Rami in the broad leaning slash saturated market is a huge challenge. How can a marketer support a MENA creator in the room when he or she is not present? They're not present, what is that like? When I think how can, um, I think the question is. I, I um, mean, I assume it's like a, like are how can marketers I, support the creators, you know, when, when, I, I guess how, how can- When they're not uh, Rami, when they're not like visual. I, I'm assuming like so, the, yeah. When they're out, not in front of the camera, maybe? Well, it's probably about just amplifying the vision of the show, like mm -hmm. seeing the show for, for what it is and what it's trying to do and trying to- Sorry, she's saying not present, but be their advocate. Sorry to interrupt you. Right, so advocating for the vision of the, sh of the show 
and figuring out how to make that palatable and marketable to the wider audience. Like rather than trying to make the vision of the show fit into the absorbable thing, how to look at the vision of the show and make that into the absorbable, like make that be the absorbable thing, like make that seem commercially appealing for, for what it actually is rather than trying to change it to fit into a preconceived idea of what people yeah. think is commercial. Because I think a lot of times people, like they might not know that they're, they're gonna like Rami, but like Rami is like, he's a great character. Like he's very likable, very love. Like you just wanna watch him, you wanna watch that story. But, but he doesn't fit into, you know, a, a, a preconceived kind of show. You have to just go into like the the, the individuality of, of of who he is and what he is, and 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 um, amplify that, and then people can see like, oh, I like that. I didn't know that. I didn't think about that. I didn't think I'd watch a show like this, but I like that guy, you know. And that show is authentically about him. Um, I don't know if that. Yeah. I think one of the great things that's happening right now in our industry is that because there is such incredible saturation and like literally it just feels like everything's been done, people are actually looking for something different. And, you know, it, it, it feels like for just for decades, all it was about was just like a formula, you know, this is what works and this is what we want and we want this, but maybe slightly different with like a fresher perspective and maybe a different face, but maybe not, maybe we'll go with the same people. But now it's just like there's so much out there that you that that your your benefit is to pitch something really different. And I think even from a marketing point of view, that's got to be really exciting because you can actually start to market things differently than ever before. And I feel like Rami's one of those shows where it was sort of marketed slightly different. I mean, it's such a unique show because in addition to you know being Middle Eastern Muslim, it's also it's a faith-based show. It's a movie, it's a show about, you know, kind of finding your belief, your spirituality, trying to be a good person, but also, you know, knowing that you're super flawed. And, you know, that's not something that we've seen a lot of. And I, and I think that I really liked the way that that, that show was marketed because, you know, it, it did, a, I thought it did a really amazing job of sort of, uh, of appealing to the universal, but really showing and highlighting the, the uniqueness and specificity of the show and therefore not dumbing it down and not making it like, oh, this is, you know, uh, not taking it away from the vision of the creator, in other words, to speak to sort of what Daria was saying, but really kind of playing into the universal and then really highlighting the, the, the vision um, as well. I'll, I'll that was exactly what I was gonna say, so I won't even take up any time. It's that combination of specificity and universality that that in marketing and supporting those creators that that is gonna, make all the difference sorry i agree i'll i'll, I'll just say this too because i i used to actually work in on-air promos and marketing for big networks before i broke in as a writer and you know that world too needs to change you know i mean like th like they should be sending over the middle eastern you know writer producers who do that to go meet with the the staff or the showrunner of these shows you know there should be change there as well. And that's something that obviously we don't, we're not taking on as well, but that, that hopefully it spills over, you know? Um, one show I just wanted to mention that I did not know was out there was this um, Paranormal on Netflix. I don't know if you guys have watched this, but it is an Egyptian series. I think it's one of the first ones that they actually, um, we're behind producing in Egypt and it is a it's kind of like our version of Watchmen or of Lovecraft Country it's it's science fiction it's horror but it's with Arab culture it's some of its Muslim culture some of it's in Egypt I it is so good and to me that was it's small not a lot of people know about it but that was another like genre breakthrough and that to me was very promising. I just wanted to throw that out there. Well, I think Netflix, the, the, the global audience of Netflix um, and the pandemic come together in that because 
one, I, you know, Netflix has developed, been developing um, local language, they call it, you know, uh, shows for specific areas of the world. And then because of the pandemic, a lot of the production slowed down. So then, then they started buying shows for, that were already uh, made and, um, so, and, and calling them Netflix original. So there's more of an, um, and there's more of an appetite now. People will watch something with, with subtitles. You know, there's Money Heist. There, there's, all, there's all these shows now, Dark. You know, there, there's all these shows on there that people have kind of adjusted to coming from other cultures. And I think that's really wonderful. And I think, um, you know, the the one, the new head of TV, um, Bella Bajaria, I believe, uh, over there talks about a global audience. And it is a kind of like wonderful, you know, wonderful, scary technology, how, how pervasive, you know, everything is. But like the technology of it is actually kind of really neat in that it's access um, for things that, audiences here may not have, it might not have been on their radar um, that, that that's now very accessible and might just play next in their queue. Hmm. Um, somebody here was asking, what has your experience been with people of color supporting you in the industry? Um, I'm just reading this, sorry, as we're, do you find there's a, do you think they are afraid to help others um, because there can only be like, I don't, I don't know how to articulate this in a smaller question because this kind of is a long question, but have you had support from other groups who have been also pushing to be represented fairly on screen? That's a tricky question, but I, I want to just share my philosophy, you know, re in regards to this, which I spent a lot of time with in the, in the theater world, is that rising tides raise all ships. There, the scarcity mentality, you know, there's only one spot for a woman. That is, that is, that it, we, we accept that, and that is part of the patriarchal structure we have to change that thinking and we have to help each other. And if we start thinking jockeying, there's only room for, you know, there's, there's, there isn't room for this minority group because there's that minority group. We are sunk, you know, that is just playing into the scarcity mentality and the remaining, you know, the, 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 the white patriarchal structures staying in existence. So it, we have to, you know, my philosophy is we have to work together. We have to work with in tandem with other groups and amplify all of the voices. It might, it might be a little uncomfortable and, and, and feel like there's not enough space for everybody, but we have to make the space and we can only do that by all doing that together. And if we keep trying to find that one little slot, we'll always be in competition uh, with each other. So we have to sort of bust out of that together. That's really well said. Yeah, it is. Um, and as far as the guild goes, you know, and the committee, all the committees, you know, we all talk to each other. Um, Cameron actually yeah. is a part of the, uh, what is it, the uh, IEG, what does it stand for? The Inclusive Equity Group? Uh, inclusion and Equity Group, yeah. <clears throat> and it's yeah. basically, it's, the chairs of that are Shonda Rhimes and um, uh, Glenn Mazzara, who are doing fantastic work over there. And it's basically, I keep on joking, it's the UN of all the committees <laughs> for the Guild. And it's just a nice way of all the communities kind of coming together and voicing, you know, all their concerns and issues about everything in the industry and then coming together and trying to lift each other up. And this conversation comes up a lot um, about how we can help each other. And I think there is there is a combination of really wanting to help each other as a larger group of diverse writers. And at the same time, I think everyone is advocating for their own specific group uh, a lot. And, and, but I, I, you know, Daria said it beautifully. Um, so, you know, I think we are, we, as, as, as one rises, we all will hopefully rise together. And I think um, I, I've noticed a lot. I mean, the, that show that I was talking about, that the company that first reached out to me 
is a company um, led by black um, a black man and woman, and um, and uh, they just like love this story, even though there there aren't black characters central to the show. Um, so that, I think that's just like a little positive anecdotal sign um, that there is uh, support and allyship. And once again, because I need to bring Rami up again, um, but you know he's the one. He's he's, he's the it. No, if you look at that second season with Mahershala Ali coming in bringing in like the black American Muslim experience. It was such a mix of things, you know, and also, you know, like no spoilers, but the uncle being mm -hmm. positive, get, all of that was mixing in so many different diverse stories that weren't about one group, that weren't about, you know, again, the specific, yeah. but also the universal. So it's save, not- Save, just like, save some, same some stories for us, Rami. I mean, seriously. <laughs> Um, someone here, I don't know, um, did we lose Shireen? I can't really see her. Um, um, so somebody's asking here, can you please speak more to your committee's plan and strategy for the future? Um, and how can upcoming filmmakers get in touch with you? Yeah, um, I mean, we have a mission statement on the WGA website um, and I mean, the general, I don't have it in front of me, but the general mission is, is to, uh, you know, build uh, employment within uh, writers, you know, uh, and also increase representation on camera in an accurate way. And those two things kind of go hand in hand, obviously, as you're increasing employment of Middle Eastern writers, they're hopefully writing accurate portrayals and creating characters that people of Middle Eastern descent can play. Um, it's, you know, it, it's, it's kind of, they're all tied together. Um, and we're, as I said, we're talking to agents, managers, producers, studio execs to make sure that, um, that they know, like they know that we exist even. It's kind of a weird thing to say, but it's not the first thought for most people in telling a story. Um, and as far as getting involved, is that was that part of the question, or am I just making that up? Paymon, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, there there's a bunch of like, you know, we another thing we do we're doing is like, you know we, we're holding a lot of events and panels like this, you know, to to, you know, educate people and build our community outside of just the WGA, and we do open it up sometimes to people that are that are pre jump WGA or just people that are interested in just you know, the conversation and wanted to be a part of it. So I would just keep an eye out. I don't know, like, if it's advertised, though, outside of the Guild website, uh, as far as events go, you might have to log in as a member. But I mean, there are ways to go to our events if there are guests. If you know somebody in the WGA that can you can ask to be a guest, you could be a plus one. Um, I'm trying to think, uh, Terry, are you on it? Are there other ways for other pre-WGA folks to yeah, um, what we can do is I think Annie Wood posted in the chat, the Twitter, and anytime there's an open event for um, pre-WGA, we could put that in the tweet. So I would, I would advise that everyone follow you all on Twitter. And then we have twice a year, all the committees have open meetings. So once there's an open meeting, we could also post that on Twitter and we would welcome anybody who's pre-WGA to come. It's a really great way to network and find community there. So I would say keep an eye out on the Twitter and we can make sure to post all that there. Yeah, so Annie just posted the Twitter our, the Twitter account in the uh, in the chat. I would just say follow that for more information. And I we have people reach out to us all the time on, on Twitter. I mean, I know I do and I'm sure you guys do too. And um, I mean, I get back to everyone. So if you have any questions about how to help out, we're, we're always there to help and we want to build the the overall things we want to build a community we want this is about building community and and getting to know each other Paymon said his you know most proud moment was when we had that first meeting I mean that first meeting almost brought tears to my eyes we had about 60 or almost 60 people there and everyone was smiling because they were all looking at all the other boxes and the faces on the screen and and uh, I remember Daria I think you you were there and you said I want to help younger writers and, and you know stuff like that so I think that's that that's that's how it happens it's 
it's baby steps, but I think we're, you know, we're getting there. Yeah, I think, um, you know, visibility, which we're working on in pipeline, which is, you know, Cameron and Payman, what you're doing, sets, you know, that groundwork um, with the institutions and, um, and making sure that Middle Eastern writers and, and actors and directors and, and, and crew are being brought into the pipeline because it's not that people don't want to hire people of diverse backgrounds or women, et cetera. It's that they just don't know them. They don't know where to look and, you know, making sure that they're being brought into the system. And I think those, those studio programs are, are a great place to start the casting, you know, those, they have those showcases, you know, making sure they're on the casting side being brought in um, and maybe setting up some kind of mentorship. I know they're setting up one uh, with the showrunner training program and um, black uh, emerging writers and, you know, a buddy system, bringing people, bringing people into the system and, 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 and helping groom them so that when those jobs open up, they are ready. And they don't can't say, oh, we couldn't find someone who was qualified. So we just went with the white guy, you know? Um, so I think that's pipeline is, 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 a, is a big part of the issue. And um, we're gonna have to wrap up soon, but I wanted to ask you if you can talk about what you um, are working on now or what you are hoping to push forward project wise, or is there anything that you can talk about that you're doing now that uh, will lead us into the future? No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm, 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 pretty, I'm pretty excited about a project that is sold uh, that is an animated series with um, Hari Kondabalu and Aparna Nancharla. Uh, who are just amazing, amazing stand-ups. And Hari made a documentary actually, and they're both South Asian. It's funny, um, I'm like cornering the market on working with South Asians. I have a <laughs> project, but you know, we're all brown, right? We're all, we're all, we all relate. Um, so yeah, anyway, ba basically this is a very diverse show and I can't really talk about exactly what it's about, but it, it's, it's gonna be very exciting. It's, it's it's everything that we're talking about here culminating into a big fun animated comedy. Fun is important. Um, okay. I'm, I'm starting a, a show uh, at Netflix um, based on a book that I wrote called Devil in Ohio. Uh, we're starting our room next week um, for a limited series. Woohoo! Uh, and I have a couple other projects in development. Um, I'm at a stage where I'm, I'm just trying to get projects going, picked up, you know, um, build my leverage and um, visibility so that I can continue to make uh, more space and um, f amplify more voices. You want me to? Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean that that script um, that I mentioned with the the Iranian lead that would be amazing. Um, the show that I mentioned about my mom. We'll see what happens there. Um, and right now I'm I'm adapting a book um, uh, that uh, Hillary Swank is producing and attached a star in. Um, that she actually read that blacklist script and then was like, "This is great. Do the help me. What about this book instead?" <laughs> um, which which is nice and. Um, and then that Western kind of biopic, um, it's a based on a true story thing that Paul Feig is attached to direct. Um, it, it's not Middle Eastern based at all, obviously. Um, it's uh, just a true story that I've always loved and was fortunate enough to get um, Paul to uh, fall in love with it too. And so um, we, we sold it as a pitch together and I um, just turned in the first draft. I thought maybe there was some secret story that I hadn't known about like Iraqi cowboys. Like what? How did I not yeah. know this? I'm in. I totally, yeah. yes. Yeah, that, that would be, that would be, that would be better. No, we could call know. it Middle Western. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh man, you've, 
yeah. That was that was beautiful. Um, Shereen, did you <laughs> want to? Yeah, I um, well, I'm I'm super excited to be directing um, the a script uh, about Shirley Chisholm. Um, who made a bid for the presidential nomination in 1972. And um, Denai Guerrera is attached to play her. And obviously that's not Middle Eastern based, but something I'm hugely passionate about, and really excited about. Um, I've also just really been diligently working behind the scenes the last few years, developing my own material. And I'm taking three of my own shows to market next month. So it's been a long time coming, putting those together. And uh, yeah, I'm super excited. One of them is um, somewhat inspired by my own family. It's a very subversive Arab American female centered drama comedy. So fingers crossed. Nice. Oh yeah. Um, thank you all so much. This has been great. And when I do panels, I want them to always be this panel. So hopefully we can arrange that moving forward, no matter what it is. Um, do we just do this every day? Is that, I mean. Yeah, a, I think everyone, a, sure, sure. Just every day. We'll find, we'll just we'll get find it. people to pay us, right? Yeah. <laughs> sure. And I can change out of my pajamas more than, you know, <laughs> once every month at this point. So, um, but thank you and thank you, MPAC. And I also wanted to say, uh, to thank Kareem Ahmed, Director of Outreach and Inclusion. Um, at the Sundance Institute. Thank you. Thank you all for tuning in. This has been great. And I hope we can do this again sometime soonish. <laughs>